أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بلاد برادرز السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين always before we begin praising Allah سبحانه وتعالى نشهد ولا إله إلا الله وتستفاد that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah سبحانه وتعالى and we send our loving greetings salutations to beloved Nabi Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم to his pious and pure family to his companions and all those who follow his sunnah until the end of time may Allah سبحانه وتعالى protect us in this dunya to be upon the sunnah of Nabi Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and in general for those in his companionship Amin walhamdulillah alhamdulillah before I begin usually at the end we mention announcements but I'd like to start off by mentioning that Antikia as we know, passed away, the lady that's on the corner, passed away this week. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Wonderful, wonderful murid of this masjid and the entire Bukab community. And uh, once again, we'd like to express our sadness uh, at her passing, but also uh, our happiness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us with such a wonderful lady. And um, everyone in this community benefited from her warmth, her generosity, her kindness. What a beautiful, beautiful janazah in spite of the rain. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to to uh, make it easy for Uncle Aziz and the children of Antikia and Allah grant a high place in Jannah and put sabr in their heart. Ameen wa alhamdulillah. Last week we began the question on homosexuality. Part of our discussion on Youth Month. Part of our discussion uh, with regards to the youth and the issues that is impacting the youth. And while this is a new issue, a modern kind of discussion, it really isn't something brand new. It's always been the case that Islam has a set of morality, set of rules, sets of do's and don'ts, and the society around it might be different to Islam. It was the case in the time of Jahiliyyah, it was the case a thousand years ago in our parents. There were different issues all the time. This is just another issue where the rules and the norms of society is different to that of Islam. And the Prophet speaks about this when he says that Islam started off as something strange, gharib. It was strange in their community. Women and men are equal, subhanAllah, what is this? This is madness. Animals have rights, this is crazy, right? It was strange. And the Prophet says, a time will come where Islam would also seem strange. You would seem like you're crazy. But what does he say? Glad tidings to the one who is a stranger. You are outside of a, a crazy society. You are the only sane one, alhamdulillah. So we mentioned Islam's position on homosexuality is very, very clear. It is haram. You cannot interpret the Quran in any other way. And when we talk about the ruling of the Sharia, it's not so much about is it halal or haram, because we all know it's haram. The question that usually comes, and our young people in particular, there's a sympathetic feeling. Even if I'm not personally a homosexual, why is it haram? Why did Allah place in me a desire and then made it haram? You have done something, uh, uh, this is sort of unjust. And so the dialogue that, I, that we find with our, our youth is that they are very sympathetic to this uh, uh, cause. And why are they sympathetic? We ask, where does that come from? It's because you are being programmed by what you watch on TV as what is normal, on social media, in school it's being taught to you. So while you only spend one hour a week in the masjid learning the morality of Islam, outside you're being taught a completely different set of rules, naturally it's going to impact you. And I said this last week, as woke as you think you are, as enlightened as you think you are, if you really ask yourself, and we're going to get into the detail today, where does my morality, what I think is good or bad, right and wrong, where does that come from? It wasn't thought out. You are just an empty glass, and whatever is poured inside of you is what you reflect. And you'd find that the morality, the things that you are okay with, is not based on any science or any uh, deep conversation. It is purely based on what is the dominant morality. And if you lived 100 years ago in Nazi Germany, chances are you would be anti-Semitic. If you lived before that in the time of Jahiliyyah, you might have been okay with burying your daughters alive because that is what society said was okay. Whereas Islam says, no, we have a higher purpose, a higher set of rules that does not change in time and place, set by not a man, it's set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So before you ask Islam, why do you put homosexuality on the haram list? I ask you, why are you okay with certain things? So let's unpack that. As a Muslim, we say, we do not accept things as halal or haram because it makes, we believe there's wisdom behind it, of course. Allah always rules, makes uh, 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 rules based on wisdom. But even if we don't understand the wisdom, we still have to obey it. Whether you understand why Maghrib is three raka'ahs and not four raka'ahs, you still make your Maghrib like that. Whether you understand the wisdom behind why Khamar is uh, uh, bad and not good or not, we, it is haram. We don't, our as Muslims, and that's what it means to be a Muslim, we submit to Allah. We say to Allah, you know and I don't know. 
Whether I understand, Alhamdulillah, that's good. But even if I didn't understand it, I trust you over my mind. That's what it means to be a Muslim. But of course, we can talk about the wisdoms. There's nothing wrong, and I must say this to our parents, there's nothing wrong with a child, your child saying, why does Allah make this haram? Why does Allah not make this halal? Because you know what? The angels asked Allah the same question. Why are you creating Adam? What's the wisdom? I, we don't understand this, Ya Allah. And Allah said, I know, you don't know. Trust me. Who am I? I'm Allah. You don't know, and I know. So we, we said, before you question Islam, ask where does your morals come from? And uh, Akramakumullah, I don't know how many, there's some small kids in here, so we have to keep it as PG as possible. But if you ask Western morality, what is it based on? Give me a rule that if I were to say, this is the rule, if, it's, if, if, if it meets this criteria, it's legal. If it meets that criteria, it's illegal. Usually they would say, look, so long as it's between consenting adults and no one gets hurt, then we're okay. So rape, obviously, we also is not consent, so it's all illegal. We all agree, happy. If it's between an adult and a child, we all agree it's illegal. Haram, alhamdulillah, because it's not two. But if it's two consenting adults that love each other, and no one is getting hurt, then why are you guys, you know, getting all excited about it? Live and let live. So, okay, fine. Based on that rule, should we then allow incest? Two brothers? Who gets hurt? They love each other? Most people will say no. We have a problem with this. But that meets the definition. And subhanAllah, we can go, and there's a lot of, lot of different fetishes. Who decides what fetish is permissible or impermissible? And you will realize if you push Western secularism on this, they will simply say there are things that we deem okay for no reason, just because we, it is out of pressure, popular demand. If enough people made noise about incest, it would also be permissible. You would also have people coming to school saying, look, the two of us were twins. We spent nine months in the womb together. Throughout our lives, we were together in the same bed. And now, alhamdulillah, you know, we love each other. We are getting married. Love is love. If enough people pushed for that agenda, it would be there. And this is you, when, you push, when you go down this rabbit hole, you realize it's not based on anything. And really, what is Western secularism based on? You're only here for 60, 70 years. Maximize your pleasure. Do as much fun as you want. Buy as many things as you want. Sleep with as many people as you want. Because when you die, it's over. So that's their purpose. And you know what's strange? You would think that that lifestyle would bring you happiness. But which people are on antidepressants? Which people are committing suicide? Not your Muslim tahajjud making Monday, Thursday fasting Buddha, anti. That person, Allah is contentment. You see them in the worst of moments. Allah had put upon them some major, major calamity. It gets the freedom with Allah. Unhappy. The other side, you don't get enough likes on Facebook and you want to kill yourself. When Allah says, this is what is good for you, it's because Allah knows us. So when you push this group, you'd find that there is no standard principles. It is okay, it is legal, legal for homosexual marriages. It is legal for prostitution. It is legal to commit adultery. But it's illegal for you to marry a second wife in most of these countries. Illegal for you to wear hijab in these countries. How? Where is the you know, consistency here? And you realize that as much as the left in liberal agenda, love for everyone, it's not love for everyone. It is love according to what we deem is permissible. And if you're outside of that, then you will be silenced. And when we talk about this issue, we are not here to criminalize them. We have passed that point. They have succeeded in being accepted. We're not here to say ban them and put them out of us. No, we are saying we are scared of being criminalized. We are worried that we will be prosecuted by teaching our kids that, look, this is zina. My boy, my girl, if you want to get married, it must be with an opposite gender in nikah. Now it becomes dangerous to say that. To say that we don't want our kids to be exposed to the messaging, the morality out there. Leave it for us to teach when they are 16, 17, whatever, past mukallaf, then yes, they will be exposed to it naturally. But don't teach four, five-year-olds about this. That's what we're asking for. We're not asking for anyone to be banned and anyone to be you know, harmed or arrested. That's not what we're asking for. We are being discriminated against now. We want to say, if you want to have your parade, we live in a free society, but give me the chance not to be part of your parade. We don't want to be part of the parade. That is what we are asking for at the moment. So when you push this, you realize that their morality is not based on anything, whereas Islam is, of course, based on Rules that will stay until the end of time, set by Al-Khaliq, the one who knows. 
and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the future, knows everything. He knows the implications to society. When he deems something haram, it is in the interest of society. Also, on this agenda of, of Western uh, morality, why we ask, why should you be defined? Why should your lifestyle, why should your identity be based on your preference, your sexual preference? We all have sexual preferences. We all have things that we like, fantasies that one. We, should we not then have a group that is into brunettes, into blondes, into the dad bods? Should we not have, for everyone there's a preference. Why is this group, their preference is a lifestyle. And you must be defined by what you want. We all have preferences and we say that's only a part of who I am. But that's not my identity. Now it's become an issue of identity. And if you don't agree with my sexual preference, you are discriminating against my identity. We say that which other, which other desire is defined by that? My hunger, my preference for food. So why do we, make, why do we change the rules for this group? And again, it comes down to no better answer than what is trendy, what is by popular demand, what makes the most noise, what gives the most likes. And so we would say that if everyone should have an equal right to express their lifestyle, then we, and to teach kids and expose them to certain things, then the guys who are into guns, they should come to primary school kids and teach them about guns, because that's their lifestyle choice, that's what they want. The guys who are into nudism should go, that, it's natural, we were born that way, they should also express that to their kids. Incest people, Satanists, all of it must come, and they say, look, this is our lifestyle, this is what we want, you should allow everyone to have a, a seat at the table. And we ask that, we understand that kids are not appropriately equipped to discuss certain issues, they can't drive a car before 18. They can't buy a packet of cigarettes, I think, until they're 21. But this discussion, they can have teen, before they are the, at the age of 10, they're already exposed to this. Cartoons have all this on. Children in the West can change their gender, remove body parts before they are even 12, 13. SubhanAllah. What do you know about, about yourself and identity? So we go back to Islam. So we said to you, before you question us as to why, we've, why is there things halal, haram, where does Islam come up with it? We say, why do you say things are right and wrong? And why have you put things as inappropriate? You will realize you have no framework. So just remember that anyone who finds conflict with your morality and Islam, realize your morality is not based on anything. It is just based on likes on Facebook. That is what your morality is based on. Ours, alhamdulillah, it's based on what we believe from the Rabbul Alameen. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask Allah, okay Allah, you made this haram. You also put desires in the hearts. You created us with desires. Is it fair, ya Allah, that you criminalize, you make it haram for someone who is, has a desire? Wallahi, there are people, and, I, and, I, and Wallah, we take our hats off to those people. There are Muslims who will say, we have same sick attraction in our heart. I want to be with a man, but I'm not gay. Meaning I've never acted on that impulse. Now think about the jihad of that brother. The whole world will celebrate him. He's come out. And everywhere he looks, he's calling, come, tafaddal. The only thing that stops him from crossing that line is because he loves Allah more. And he says, this is my, I identify as a Muslim first. And so I will not cross that line. That is a high level of taqwa. You want to look at a wali, that inshallah is a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is their test. And Allah tests all of us with different kinds of tests. So we ask Allah, is it fair? Firstly, we don't know where this comes from. And even if it was, even if you were born with it, even if we find out that there is a fabulous gene and that is what you've been born with, we say there are people that are born disabled. There are people born with autism. There are people born with, with whatever differences. People are born with certain inclinations, addictions. You know, sometimes you, out of your control, something happened to you as a child, not your fault, and now you are damaged. We say to that, I mean, subhanAllah, look at the pedophile. So many of them would say, I'm like this because something happened to me as a child, not my fault. Now, I have this great desire for children. We say, we sympathize with you, but we can't change the rules for you. You need to, that's your jihad. You need to fight it as much as you can, and you need to fight that desire, and you must say to yourself that this desire is not right. And wallahi, that's not unique to you. I have a desire for women, but there's only one woman on earth that I can express that desire with is my wife. The next beautiful woman that walks past, something stirs in my heart, I have to fight it. This is haram, look away. Make tawbah, make istighfar. All of us go through that. In Ramadan, we're all hungry. 
that uh, Kusista is calling to us. But we say, no, Maghrib time. And that is what it means. That is what Islam means. I submit my desires, in this, my nusuk, my life is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so everyone is struggling with this. And so we say to the brothers, yes, the sisters and the brothers that have this, it's a much, much greater struggle. It is, subhanAllah, the only thing I can basically link it up with is a person who has a drug addiction. They're chemically addicted. Even if they could get away from it, they would. But they can't. Their body is controlled by this thing. What do we do with the drug addict? We say, come, let us support you. Let us give you the help that you need. We're not going to condemn you and curse you. But we'll say, this is haram. Don't do it. It's bad for you. We will help you and hold your hand as much as we can. And that is really the, the, the process that we say. And remember, Jamaat Muslimin, Islam does not condemn feelings. In Allah's mercy, He does not punish you for a feeling that you have in your heart. So, you feel like you want to slap your husband. No sin on you. Only sin when you slap him. Then it's a sin. Okay? So, Islam does not criminalize feelings. In fact, Allah rewards you for having a negative feeling that you hold back. That is Allah's mercy. And so, we don't judge people on feelings and attractions. We judge, not judge even, we respond based on how you act. If you act on that feeling, then it's a problem. But if you don't, then alhamdulillah, you are, you are holding on to that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not hold us accountable for that. And we need to talk about this, that they are Muslims. That if they could, they would switch off those feelings. If they could. But they don't have the power to do it. And therefore Allah does not hold you accountable for something out of your control. And we said that this was always the plan of Allah. We know in that very famous hadith, the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed Jibreel, Jahannam. And he showed Jibreel Jannah and he said, you know, what do you think? And Jibreel subhanAllah, I haven't seen anything worse than Jahannam. I haven't seen anything better than Jannah. Then Allah showed the path to Jahannam, filled with all the fun, nice things, all the temptations. And he showed the path to Jannah, salah, dhikr, fasting. So Jibreel said, I fear no one is going to get to Jannah and everyone's going to go to Jahannam because the path to Jahannam is filled with the nice things. And that is the test of life. Allah alam, you know, you know this is a much bigger discussion, but this is the part of Allah's hikmah. What makes us, I do a series Islam from scratch, what makes you and I better than the angels is because they submit, they don't have a choice. We have every desire screaming out at us and we say no, Allahu Akbar, and we put our head on the ground. That is greater than being an angel. And that is why we deserve Ibn Allah Jannah for that sabr and that, and that sacrifice. So this is the purpose of life, that we prioritize our love for Allah over our own desires. Now certain questions may arise, how do I love an Islamic lifestyle with same-sex attraction. There are some people that are struggling with this, and I think we spoke about that. Allah does not judge you based on your attractions or your feelings, but you must fight it. And you must know that this is not a feeling, an attraction that is good to, ex to, to exercise on. The same way I know I should, not I should not give in to my desires that is haram. My attraction to people that are not permissible, I should fight them. And I should not be in a situation that tempts me. If you are, you are recovering drug addict, you should not be working in a pharmacy, for example. You know, be, 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 be careful. So this is the thing that we all, we all struggle with. And if you, subhanAllah, you have that attraction, you have that addiction, and you fall off the wagon, you made a mistake, do it privately, repent, ask Allah for istighfar, believe in His mercy, and you start again immediately on your road to recovery. That is what, and subhanAllah, that's not just, not just for them, that's for all of us. Who of us? When we look back at Ramadan, the kind of people we were, the sins we gave up, how many of us have fallen back in those sins? All of us, subhanAllah. We all know our sins. It's not about publicizing any sin here. But what do we do? You make that sin, then your senses come back to you, you go to the musallah, you make istighfar, and you believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you. If that very famous hadith, if Allah forgave the man who killed 99 people, do you really think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to forgive a person who genuinely makes a mistake and repents and regrets, no matter how big the sin is. Remember, what we learn, our belief is, it doesn't matter how big the sin is. So long as you recognize it's a sin, not to the imam, but to Allah, and you make istighfar and tawbah and say, Ya Allah, the problem is me, not you. Alhamdulillah, Allah is happy with your repentance. And so you have types of people, types of sinners. You have the person who has the feelings in their heart and they don't act, they're not a sinner. In fact, they are mujahideen, they are fighting a jihad. We admire them because wallahi, I don't know how many of us would have the same kind of strength like them. Then there are those who have the feeling, they know it's haram, but they give in to their temptation. And that is like all of us. We are all, this, we are all in that same boat, most of us here. And we say to that person, you make istighfar and tawbah, you keep your sin private, 
You don't publicize it. You don't put it on Facebook. You don't celebrate it. Make the istighfar, and there's a place for you in Allah's mercy. Then there's those who commit the sin, and they publicize it. Well, this is like, and subhanAllah again, let's not just talk about that group. There might be the girl who doesn't wear the hijab. You might have the guy in the office party and he says, uh, Ahmed, you here drinking with us, but Fatima says she can't be part of this party. Why? Now, when that happens, the right thing to do is say, you know what? Nothing wrong with Fatima, something wrong with me. I know it's not part of my religion. Make dua I get there one day. This is still better. Because now you're saying, look, I'm a sinner. I don't feel bad about the sin. I love my sin too much. But I know one day, inshallah, I want to get there. This is still better. And so if you are in even publicly committing the sin, you are living the lifestyle, at least acknowledge this is not part of the Sharia. Don't try to change Islam to suit your lifestyle. At least say, I'm a Muslim, but I'm not there yet. I want to get there. I still make salah, I still believe in Allah. The problem, the real problem, is where someone says, Islam is wrong. My lifestyle is correct. Islam must change. This is now the difference between a person that has feelings and acts on his sin versus an agenda on a community. Now it's an agenda, an onslaught on our morality. And that is a problem. And that is where we say this, this is where we draw a line. Then there's no soft talk here. And we say that person, potentially, like the person who says khamar is okay, pork is okay, hijab mustn't be allowed in Islam. We need to change the rules. This is borderline kufr. Borderline kufr. Because you are now challenging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if you don't do the sin yourself. So look, I don't drink alcohol, but I think Islam must allow alcohol. Because the Islam is backwards. We say this is now borderline kufr because it challenges Allah. And so, and again, as I say so many times, it is not for anyone here to declare anyone kafir. Don't ever use that word. The Nabi says, whoever prays like us and he faces our qibla and he eats our halal food is a Muslim and is under Allah's protection. So do not betray the, the, the protection of Allah. We never ever say it. So to close off, inshallah, we said that this is a big discussion and we'll continue next week. What is the way forward on this topic? Remember, the same way our parents had to sit in school learning hymns, Jesus loves us and all of that. They, many brothers smiling. You had to sit in that. You had to be given messaging in school that didn't align with what you learned in the madrasa. But you were taught that look, this is what a Muslim does. What they do, we don't, we're, not going to, we're not there to fight them. What they bring to food, if they bring their pork and stuff to food, they have the right to eat it. But you can't do it. And the message is the same. Sons and daughters, you, made, you took the kalima. You're a Muslim. This is what Allah has given you. No matter what society does, no matter what is okay, we know what is okay for us. And so we are not going to be able to change society. It's always, we are a minority and we live in that storm. But we have to say our iman comes first. And so the beginning is you, we have to connect with Allah. The only thing that stops our kids, stops us from doing sin today. It's not the imam is going to hit you. There's no jihad or anything like that. It's your taqwa. No one knows. No one knows what you're doing at night on your phone. It's only the taqwa that prevents you. So we need to build on that taqwa in our relationship. Our kids need to have a strong connection with Allah and Islam. That if I do this, I lose my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then that is for us on the, on the ground, for each individual. But it is also for our lawyers. And if there are any lawyers in the group and educators, teachers, professionals, what are the guidelines? What can we do? What can't we do? How do we protect the, the masjid now? We now are looking for our protection. You know, it's not about persecuting a group. We don't want to be persecuted. We don't want to go to jail. But if someone wants to give a lecture here against our values, if we say no, it's a discrimination. Someone applies to a job for an imam and he's of a certain persuasion. Can we say no based on his orientation? That's discrimination. So these are the things that we need the bright minds to help us formulate this. Our imams need to talk about this more uh, prominently and, and give guidelines for us. We need to assist those Muslims that are struggling with same-sex attractions. Who do they turn to? And we need to talk about this maybe next week. If your kid, may Allah protect, your sister, your brother, comes out with us, your friend, how do we handle it? You, know, you don't take them to the dukum to mantra him out. It's not going to work. You need to talk. You need to discuss. There needs to be a conversation with love, with love. And then as parents, always at the end of the day, we need to do our job and make sure that we show the morals of Islam in our house and make dua that the time that we have to let the reins go, they are ready to make the right choice. May Allah protect us and our families. Uh, next week, inshallah, we'll talk about all these kind of questions. And uh, just a quick few announcements. I know we're over time. On this topic, 
one of the best ways of saving a person from this is to be in a halal nikah. That's the best thing. That's the b greatest way of saving. And many, many young people, alhamdulillah, want to maintain their Islam, their deen. They don't want to go out and do things haram. They're finding it difficult to meet a member of the opposite sex to get married. So inshallah, Burhanu is doing our first meet and treat where 10 single young men and 10 single young Muslim women to meet each other in a halal controlled environment. And uh, we hope that from there, Nikah will happen, that's the Niyah. And for those who are interested, we're still working out the details, you can contact us and you can email me, and inshallah we will work out the logistics. I will choose the best 10, the, inshallah, right? And um, um, for those uh, uh, who, are, who are planning for Qurban, we obviously offer the Qurban services. Jazakallah khair. Wa sallallahu sayyidina Muhammad wa alayhi sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa